We're very fortunate to have with us here today PJ Rogers, uh, but some of you actually may know him because he also joined our faculty this past semester, and we're really pleased to have him here as our concluding speaker for this semester. Uh, one of his first and foremost accomplishments, he, he says, is marrying his wife, Lori, and their five beautiful children. And he, PJ wants you to all know he's from the great state of Texas. Any of you that know Texans, you know that's an important thing to be able to say with gusto. He graduated right here from BYU-Hawaii in 1994. Uh, then he went on to get his MBA from um, a prestigious university in South Korea, Yonsei University, and is currently finishing up his PhD uh, as well. He spent the better part of 15 years living in Korea where he has been um, involved with many startup businesses. I think it's over 120 startup businesses. So he's an expert. So you out there that are thinking of starting up a business, this is going to be wonderful for you to hear from him today. Although he did his first business here in Hawaii, and he says he failed miserably. So that's part of life too. Sometimes you start businesses and they don't go that well. But then he went over to Korea with I believe it's like $300 and maybe a round trip ticket and uh, got involved at least in one business after a while that's very successful called East West Consulting in 1996. He still is the managing director of that and uh, he's been very successful in, with various multinational companies. PJ is fluent both uh, in, in Korean uh, language. He's actually been on multiple TV talk show, been a host there. Uh, he was his own radio personality over there. Uh, he's been an adjunct professor at Kyunghee University for four years in Korea. He's been a motivational speaker and done a lot to build business contacts, uh, especially in the Far East. We're really pleased to have him. We don't want to uh, leave out, though, his most important other item besides his family as he says that he loves the gospel of Jesus Christ. Please join me in welcoming PJ Rogers to the Entrepreneurship Guest Lecture Series today. Okay, I'm gonna try. Uh, my voice kind of left me yesterday to do it without a mic. Can everyone hear me if I speak like this? Anyone not hear me? Okay, great. Uh, this is my family, uh, and I do love my family. It's the reason I exist now. I did marry late. I married when I was 38. Uh, graduated, like he said, in 1994 from the greatest university on the planet, which all of y'all have the great opportunity to, to, opportunity to attend, and I thought that might be the case. That's going to be a bummer if that doesn't work. Okay. Okay, my first question is, why are you here? And more importantly, what do you want from me? You're going to be with me and listen to me for the next 40 minutes or so, 30 minutes, whatever time we got left. So I need to know what you want from me. Okay. You spoke up, but you raised your hand first, so you get the... To learn, okay. To, what, do, what, what do you want to learn? We always we're gonna learn. What are we gonna? What do you want to learn? Uh, I guess like, I mean, you talk to, like, you have done a lot of startup companies, so just learn you know, different ways that you can be motivated. You can learn how to do it. We'll call it startup stuff, okay? Uh, it's not. They learn startup stuff. Great. What? Work and fam. Okay. What else? Money. Okay. Great. What else back there? Uh, 
Pencil power foreign. Okay. Yes. Great. Okay, I'm gonna. That's about all I can do for now. Let's see if that works. That'd be great. Thanks, Justin. Sorry. It works there. I'm not sure why. Okay, next. It's going to be a pain. But. Okay, next. Okay, go. One more. Okay, the most important thing during when I'm talking is that you keep an open mind. I'd like you to shake my hand. Shake my hand, just like a normal shake. You, you can't. Uh, a closed mind is much like a closed fist. It can't give or receive. You can't do anything with, if, if, she, her, if she has a fist and I have a fist, there's no shaking going on. Open your mind to think, oh, maybe I can do this. Maybe I can do that. But I'll tell you what you're going to learn by is not by the words that I speak. You're going to learn by the spirit that talks to you. Because the spirit just doesn't talk to you for church stuff. The Spirit talks to you for your family, for your career, for your money, for your school, for everything you do, the Spirit's going to guide you. And today I'm going to be talking about some things and you're going to get other ideas and I would ask you to not only write down what I say, but write down what the Spirit talks to you and tells you about. Okay, okay. I'm going to do this. Uh, I'm going to do a little addition game here. I need an, um, an addition game. I need y'all all to, this is very simple. Uh, I come from this land of Korea, which is probably one of the top two or three countries in the world in math. And in the United States, I think we're like 48th or something. So I'm going to go through this, and I'm going to have you add this up, but I'm going to have you do it aloud. So we're going to start aloud with 1,000. Ready? 1,000. Okay, and then I'm going to show you the next figure. And then you're going to say 1,030. And the next figure, 1,000 however many. You know, just keep adding it. We're going to, we'll start again. Okay, ready? We're going to do this fairly Fairly quick. Ready? Go. Okay, that's a little slow. So we're gonna go. St- we're gonna do it again. So we're gonna start again. But you're gonna do. I have to do it really quick. Ready? Go. Answers five thousand. Wrong. 4,100. 4,090 plus 10. There was no trick, trick, trick in there. 4,000, and this doesn't work. 4,090 plus 10 is what? 4,100. How many said it? 4,100. Why? Why would everybody in this class, all college students, all know that very simple? Why would you say 4,001, not 4,100, but 5,000? Because we are creatures of habit. You do what you do because that's what you've done. And when we say 1,000, 1,000, 1,000, our mind automatically goes to 1,000. <clears throat> Wheat. Uh, our mind automatically goes to a thousand. Because of that, you have to be able to control yourselves and control your thoughts and your actions so you don't automatically say 5,000 when you see a problem. When, you, when you're in business and you have a great idea and you're going to transfer that idea, you're going to hear somebody else say something to somebody else. But you can't say 5,000. You got to really think about it and figure it out. Because we are creatures of habit, and you're going to do the same thing. When you take a shower, you normally do the same thing. You wash the same thing from head to toe or toe to head. Or when you put on makeup or whatever you do, you're always doing the same thing because we're creatures of habit. So you've got to be careful because you're creatures of habit. I'm going to tell you a few secrets today. The first secret is this. The first secret is meeting. This is why I ask you. Because today, a few of you, I'm going to meet your expectations of why you came today. Hopefully I'll meet all of your expectations of coming here and you think you didn't waste your time. Meeting expectations is the reason you'll make money. 
People ask me, what do you do for a living? I says, I make people happy. Because when people are happy, they pay you. And they're happy to pay you when they're happy. The basic, if you make someone happy, cause you, and the reason you're making someone happy is why? Who could tell me? What? Because you want to? You're fulfilling their needs. What is business? Why do, why do you go pay someone money? Because they're fulfilling a need. Everything but taxes, right? Taxes, I don't think we're filling anybody's need, but everything else you're going to buy in and paying money for, it's fulfilling a need, <clears throat> a need that you have. Ah, oh, my voice is killing me. Okay, uh, but that's secret one, is meeting expectations, and today I will do that with you. Number two is you are already successful, and I'm going to tell you why. You know, people think of, of, what is success? Who can define success for me? What's success? What's a good definition of success? Yes. Accomplishing a set goal. Okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, great. Accom what, who, who else? Yes, back there. Pursuit of a worthy ideal. Love that. What else? Anybody else? Yes. To be happy with yourself. Love that too. Love it all. Love all these thoughts. I'd write those down too. The, the best definition is similar to his for me is success is the progressive realization of a worthwhile goal. Progressive realization. Because people will say, okay, I have a goal to be a college student at BYU Hawaii. Well, as soon as you get here, you become a failure unless you have your next goal that you're working towards. Does that make sense? So right now, I'll tell you, fellas, ladies, you are successful. You're amazingly successful right now because you've reached goals and you're going towards your next goal. One goal is to get an A in this class, for example, or to get a 3-5 or, or whatever your goal is for the next goal. You are already creating or making that goal happen. So don't think, oh, I'll be successful when. <laughs> ah, that's baloney. You're successful now. And, but what, what I, I was tell, talking to my brother the other day about this, and he goes, well, PJ, you got to be careful about saying that because we're in, the, we're in the world now of everybody gets a trophy world, right? Everybody gets a trophy. We can't have one student get a trophy and one student not get a trophy because that's not right. You know, we got, everybody needs to be number one. No! You know what? The world's not like that. Everyone's not number one. It's kind of hard, but... Uh, who, who's seen the movie that uh, if you're not first, you're last? What's second place? First loser. You know, that's harsh, but in a lot of ways it's true in our world. And so, but I'm not telling you that you have to be first. I'm telling you to be happy. Be successful, and the reason you're successful is because you're headed toward a, another goal. You've reached goals, and now you're reaching more goals. That's why you will be successful in business. Okay, everything in this world starts with what? In my, yeah, a thought. Everyone think, everything starts with a thought. It quickly goes to words, then it goes to an action. Okay, everything, everything you do. After that, it goes, turns into a habit. You do an action over and over again, it becomes a habit. Pretty soon, those habits turn into character. Your character is formed by initially what? What you're thinking, what you're thinking. Pretty soon you have your environment, you de develop your environment by the way you are. Your character will build people and want people around you or certain things around you. And pretty soon you're, you have people around you that are kind of like you are. And that's developed because of the way you think. If you want to change your environment, what do you got to change? The way you think. And who controls the way you think? You do. So if you have a bad environment, go, dang, what are you doing? Because you get to choose that. You absolutely get to choose that. And ultimately, it's your destiny. Because I truly believe destiny is not by chance. It is a choice. Destiny is not by chance. Destiny is a choice of where you're going, what you're doing, who you're going to be with, how you're going to do it, how, what a wonderful marriage you're going to have or not a marriage, what a, how successful you're going to be in business or not. Okay, number two. Secret number two is build your assets. Okay, lady right there in the lime shirt, uh, what's your biggest asset? 
Do you know what an asset is? An asset is something you own that's yours that is of value. Even your testimony, you own your testimony, so a testimony would be value. What else? A computer, that's an asset, sure. What's an asset that you have? A savings account, great. Okay, what's an asset that you have, Elder Kwan? What's an asset? Maybe your beautiful wife. <laughs> Family. Your family. What's an asset that you have? Um, education. An education. Great. Build your assets. Build your assets. One of the best assets that you're going to have is building your network. Building your network. Have you ever heard, it doesn't matter what you know, it matters? Who believes that? Okay. I think you're all wrong. Because I think you have to add one more step to it. Because it doesn't matter what you know, and it does, often doesn't matter who you know. It matters who you know and what they will do for you. It doesn't matter what you know and who you know, because I bet you know a lot of people that won't do squat for you. You go and ask a professor, hey, can you do a letter of recommendation? No. Well, good asset that is, right? You know people, but what will they do for you? So the question is, how do you develop a great network? I'm pretty darn good at networking. And I, before I left BYU Hawaii, I'd more, I had more than a thousand names in my network. If someone has a lot of names in their network, how many, in your network, how many names would you have? Including family, friends, any, anybody, what's a lot to you? A few hundred? How about 500? Is that a lot? 500? How about you? I probably have like 100. 100? What's that? Justin? How many do I have? No, how many? If somebody has a lot. 500 plus? 1,000 maybe? That's a lot. I, this is, I just took this picture a while ago from the, my phone. If you go to your contacts and you go to the bottom, it'll tell you how many contacts you have. I left BYU Hawaii with a thousand. And the reason I had a thousand is because when I was here, I, I started to develop what I call my ABC networking. ABC networking. And how I did ABC networking is I would make myself a name card, first of all. When you made a card, you could give one. And when you gave a card, you could often get one. And when you get a card, when you get that contact, then the really work begins, right? Making the initial contact is easy, right? After you get a card, I'd write A, B, C, or D on that card. Literally, D was a trash can. C went on my Christmas card list. B went on a couple times a year. And my A was every quarter I would send these guys a letter. This was before emailing. I could email them. Emailing wasn't around you. Intramail was kind of started, but that was all. So this was all uh, uh, sticking it, writing the letter, going to the computer lab, GCB, typing them up, and sending them off to all of these countries. And I was working my way through college. Mom and dad didn't pay, I paid. And so when I, that was a lot of money for a student. A lot of money for a student to put 45 cents on a stamp. That was international prices back then. And to, to send these out, because I sent out hundreds of them. And when, how, if I sent out 100 of these letters, how many do you think I'd get back? Maybe one. Maybe one. Hardly ever did I ever get re replies. But what did I do the next quarter? Send it out again. What did I do the next quarter? Send it out again. What did I do the next quarter? Send it out again. You know what happened? Was when I, two years, three years, four years, whatever, however many years later, when I went to whatever country I had been sending contact that person in, and I went and I was in Korea, and they said, hey, PJ. I hadn't heard from him in three years, you know. One of my greatest contacts in Korea right now works for Hanjin Shipping Company, and I met him at, in Honolulu at the gas station. We were at a gas station, and I met him. He's Korean. Han Yaseo, You know, I was talking to him and uh, got his name card. He worked for Hanjin Shipping, and I thought, ooh, he's an A. He was a director. Now he's senior vice president of Hanjin Shipping. Great, great contact. Ended up making a lot of money because of that contact. And he's one of my very, very good friends to this day. 
Talked to him a few weeks ago, talking about internships, sending students uh, there next summer. And it's because I kept in contact with this guy in my networking. But you think, what do you say to a guy? What do you, what do you, what do you write in a letter to a person that you don't know, but you think he's a good contact or she's a good contact? Anybody have an idea? What do you do? Dang, y'all are idealists. Yes. Absolutely, absolutely. But you think about it, if it's a young kid, if it's a junior high school kid, and they're starting to write you a letter as a, as a, t a college student, and a junior high school kid, what's he going to write and say to you that's going to interest you at all? Yes? Can I ask a question, maybe about the company, just like things that you're curious about? Uh-huh. Show that you're interested in them and, and what they do. Okay, what? Stroke their ego a little bit. Great, perfect. Perfect. Um, kind of going back to what you said, not about how many people you contact, but what they can do for you. What they can do for you? Great. When you, when you write them, you're going to tell, bring some value to them. When I met this guy at the gas station, what am I going to write to him, right? So I started talking about all the shipping things that were going on in Hawaii. And I get the newspaper, you know, the Honolulu Advertiser, and find a cool article about the shipping and send that to them. You know, something that's happened with Matson either in the States or here, or something else in the States from USA Today or Time Magazine or whatever. Something to do with shipping and just constantly be sending him articles about interesting things and writing about them. And translating them half into Korean, you know, because they're in English. This guy loved me. It was a very short time. This guy loved me. And we, once again, we just met one time at a gas station. We had some products to be cleared, and he was huge in helping those products be cleared. I didn't know how to, a thing how to do it, so I started my company. So I go to Korea, $300 on a plane ticket, like I mentioned. $300, what do you do with $300 in a foreign country? You don't, you know? That, in Korea right now, that, you're lucky if you get a decent hotel at that for the $300. So what do you do? You use your network, the network that you have had and these friends that you already have. And that's what I did. For the, next, for the first two weeks, I stayed at someone's house. The next, uh, about 18 months, almost two years, I stayed in a basketball dorm of the Yonsei University basketball team. I taught them English once a week. I didn't ever teach them English. But I made really good friends with the coach. And I was telling him about what I was. He said, oh, go stay in my dorm. And they fed me and housed me. And I wore a lot of their sweats for two years. It was great. And these guys were like the Michael Jordans of Korea. They were really famous. So it was a huge boost to me. Huge boost. But I never put anybody in the network that I think, oh, I'm going to take something from you. I don't think that. I literally don't think that. Because if you think that, ultimately that's going to come out. Because if I keep asking you for things, and I ask you and ask you and ask you, pretty soon you're going to feel that. And, and what, how are you going to feel about me coming around it's not very good. I think, oh, when I have somebody, and then what I do in my, and now it's really, really cool with the smartphone, is I put construction worker China. So if anything related to construction in China, I just pull, and all of those construction workers from China pull up. Once again, your network, and you are, you right now, you are amongst the greatest uh, asset ever, because right here in this room, there's probably 10 countries represented or more. In school, there's, you know, 70, 80 something. And most of you will leave and know very few people here. You might be Facebook friends, but that's all. Because Facebook networking is very different than real networking. Keeping in contact with people is a pain. It's not easy. I know, I've done it. About 80%, about probably 15 or 20% of these 4,000 plus people, I don't know that well. But about 75, 80% of them, I could probably sleep on most of their couches. Because I've spent the time to network, and networking is not for money. It's a great benefit, it's a side benefit, it's a fringe, huge fringe benefit, is making money. But if you know people, people love to help out other people, especially people they like. I, I wish, this is about a three hour thing that I wish I could take, so I'm kind of going through it pretty quick, but networking is one of the most important things that I'm gonna teach you today. Because of my networking, I'm able to get business done. I'm able to get lower prices. I'm able to get 
uh, because of the relationships that I have with people, I can get things, made th make things happen much, much quicker. When I was, my first business here, the, re the reason I failed in my first business, talking about your, the mistakes I've made, is I didn't look at the market well enough. I didn't do my homework and go in and say, because it, it was teaching uh, English and Korean to Korean kids here. There's a, there's a jillion Koreans here that don't speak good enough English, and their parents will pay big bucks for them to study extra. And so I didn't go do my homework for that. Ended up putting, I'd, I'd saved around 15, 10 to $15,000, it was something like that, to go into this business with a partner. Second thing is, is I didn't check out my partner well either. Didn't check out my partner, nor did I check out the business. I didn't understand the, that, that particular business. I didn't benchmark on other businesses that were happening. I didn't benchmark on the, their revenues, their business model. I didn't benchmark on anything. I thought, oh, I'm going to go do this myself. I kind of I figured it out. I'll make it. And the cost, didn't figure out the cost. Whatever business you have and you think, oh, okay, it's going to cost maximum $15,000 to get this business off and running. Just plan on 30. Just plan on 30 if you figure it's 15. Do not, you, you know, after you do all it out and just, you know, you're really not, you know, I mean, not conservative, but just overlandish, oh, it's going to cost us X, just double that. And if you don't have double, then don't go into that business right now because it's a little dangerous. Okay, any questions? I'm either really good at explaining or y'all aren't listening. One of the two. Yeah. Uh, what I will do is I will contact people randomly all the time because somebody from the past will cross through my mind. I will take out 15 seconds and jot them. It's really easy now because you can jot them on your phone, an email. Just random people at random times. Some, another thing I'll do with my networking, if I, I could pull up my phone, but if I pulled up my phone and I pulled up Justin Moss, for example, well, I, I already have Justin Moss. His, uh, you know, I, I taught him in 371 supply chain. He's getting married, the name of his fiance, you know, all, all of this information about Justin Moss. So five years later, when we happen to be maybe talking on the phone, I look up, and, oh, how's your wife and call her name? Hmm. Maybe you're at a dinner and you hear some business guy, you know, that you're at a round table and you hear him talking about his daughter's graduation from high school, you know, this, this summer, you know, and two years later, you write and say, hey, well, how's your daughter uh, in college? Because I know she graduated a couple years ago. He's like, how in the world would you have known that? I, uh, a Mongolian student came into my office the other day and was, uh, she's leaving and I really like her. She's great. I love her, her and her husband. They have two children. And so I says, hey, uh, write down, because Mongolian names are the hardest in the world for me to pronounce. And I put in there and I had her write out her name and her children's names and their dates. Why? Because later, what if I write her a note and says, hey, and how's your 18-year-old daughter? Blows them away. And it's a very simple process to do. It's a very simple thing that you can do, that you can, uh, and people see great value in that you know them. You don't just know their name, but you know them. You know something about their kids. Maybe you heard an anniversary date or a birthday. It's huge. That is huge. Number three, expect great things to happen. Yes. Uh, do you ever do enough? I would say you don't. You don't ever, I, oh, okay, yeah, now we've done enough, now we're ready to go. No, yeah, I don't think there's ever enough. The, what, the best way I can do market research that I've, because I've developed my network, there's really no business that I can't get a backdoor to, if you will, because I have really an extensive network in most areas. And if I don't, somebody that I know does, or, you know, two, through three people. So the first thing you do is go through the people that you know would be the, 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 one of the best avenues. The second one is most companies that you may be a competitor with love money. They love to sell you something. And it might cost you a little bit, but to go buy something and have them explain how wonderful they are and how they do everything. Because if you're a customer and they want to impress you, they're going to tell you, they're going to open up their shirt, right? But if you're the, the gas station on the other corner and you come over here, they're not going to tell you anything. Right? But if you're their customer all the time, you're, they're going to tell you everything that you want. Does that make sense? So go be a customer and go be the most 
Oh, you, you, you stroke the ego. Oh, you're the one most greatest. Well, how do you do this? This is awesome, you know? Where do you market? Well, I just saw it here at other places you market because I want to tell my friends about it. They're, they're going to open up their shirt three times. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay, did I meet that expectation? You did. Sweet. You. Meet expectations. You meet expectations to make people happy, they will come back again. Expect great things to happen. When you walk into an interview, when you walk into a sale, when you're selling bug spray in Hawaii and you walk to a door, don't go up and think, ah, oh, they're not going to buy it, but I'll ask anyway. You know? Just go home. Go home if that's your thinking. I told an experience in, in, um, in a class of mine. I used to be a boxer. I boxed for uh, a number of years. There was one particular time. I was, and then I don't have much time. Uh, there, was a, there was a box. I went into a box. When you go into a boxing ring for the first time, or excuse me, a boxing club, the coach will normally take you and put you in with one of the really good fighters and have you spar. And they'll do that because they want to see if you're really into it. They want to see if you're really into that bo boxing and you're not doing it because your girlfriend thinks it's cool or you want to be, walk around and tell people you're a boxer. And so they beat you up pretty good the first day. And that's pretty a normal thing that a club will do because they don't want to waste time on you. And if you come back after getting beat up pretty good, then, then they'll kind of start working with you. Well, that happened to me. And I was, walked into this club, and I'd, I'd, I'd fought for a number of years. This is when I was in college, right before my mission. And I'd already won the, the uh, Dallas Golden Gloves. And this was for the Texas Golden Gloves, the tournament I wanted to go into. And I walk in, and there's a 6'8 boxer who I found out later, this is in 1988. In 1984, he, he was on the Olympic team in LA that fought in those Olympics. I didn't know that. He was amateur still. He's like 30 something years old. You know, I'm 19. I'm pretty big at the time. I'm about, right now I'm probably 235, 240. At the time I was about 275, 280. And I was in good shape. I was a lineman for college. I played uh, football. And uh, so I get in there and I'm starting to box this guy. And he, he's going like, hit me, hit me. And he's a big boy, you know. And so I hit him, you know, I hit him. And he, he's like, hey, hit me again, you know. And, so, and he's kind of ticking me off. And I swing, and I hit him really good a shot in the side, and I could tell I hurt him. Because in sparring, you don't go all out, right? You don't try to kill the other guy, but I, I hit him basically as hard as I could, and I got him. And you could see his countenance changed. Now it wasn't for fun anymore, <laughs> you know? And I'm thinking, crap, you know? <laughs> anyway, he ends up hitting me in my chest, and it stopped my breathing. <laughs> I couldn't breathe in, I couldn't breathe out. I couldn't breathe. I thought, I didn't, you know, he hit me that hard. Well, I ended up, you know, we ended up stopping the spar match and, you know, came back and, you know, being my good friend, he was a mute, couldn't talk, had the most beautiful handwriting, he had special gloves because his hands were so big. Great guy. Anyway, we go into this Texas, I don't know what in the world this dude was doing in amateur boxing. He fought, you know, so now we're going for the Texas State championship, right? Golden Gloves. And you, and you start on Tuesday. You fight on Tuesday if you win. You know, you keep going until Saturday night. Well, they put us in the separate brackets because we're from the same club. Well, we meet at the championship. So what do you think I'm thinking when I'm going into the fight with this guy who, if would have hit me in the head, I think would have killed me. He stopped my breathing, hit me in the chest. What do you think I was thinking? I thought, I feel sorry for Darren today. I feel sorry for Darren today because he has to fight me. There was not a thought in my head that I might lose because a true winner will never let the thought of, of, of a defeat enter his head. That's a great statement. A true winner will never let the thought of defeat or the thought of it not happening, the thought of not getting the job, not getting the sale, enter their head. Because as soon as it enters your head, that's when it becomes to start to realize it. Because everything starts with a what? A thought. Then your words, then your actions. When you're going in for an interview, they need you. That's what you got to think. You're the greatest person for this position. I don't care who was in the lobby with you and where they went to school and what experience they did. They need you. And no, you're not always going to get the job or not always going to make the sale. But I promise you, expectations will often much more be met. And if you expect to lose, you probably will. Then you're not disappointed, yeah. That's a terrible way to live life. Expect great things to happen. So I got a question for you. 
I got a question for you. Let's start with you. Uh, if you could answer me in a full sentence, please. What, what are, can you speak the Arabic language and answer me in a full sentence? Um, I cannot speak the Arabic language. Okay, I cannot speak the Arabic language. Okay, uh, let's see. How about you right here? Can you run a mile in four minutes? Just a short answer sentence. Can you run a mile in four minutes? I what? I cannot. I cannot run a mile in four minutes. Great. Third one is you. Okay. Can you give birth to a child? I cannot give birth to a child. Okay. I apologize, but you and you answers was incorrect. His answer was the only correct answer. Because he cannot give birth to a child. You can speak Arabic, you just haven't learned. Right or wrong? Right, and you could probably run a four-minute mile if that was all you trained for for the rest of your life. Right. right. There is no freaking can't. I grew up with a dad that we could not use the word can't in our home. He would say, PJ, the only thing you can't do is have a child. And he would turn to my sister and say, Phoebe, that means ain't nothing you can't do. <laughs> True or not true? It's amazing how much we use the word can't. You're going to hear yourself the word can't. If somebody says the word can't to me, you know what I say? Tink. And what does tink mean? That's a negative vibe coming, bouncing off my positive shield. <laughs> tink. Because there is no can't. So let's, let's do that again. Can you, uh, can you uh, speak Arabic? I can learn to speak Arabic. Right. Or, I cannot now, but I can learn. Or, I haven't learned yet. Can you run a four-minute mile? I can train to run a four-minute mile. Great. Can you speak German? I can learn to speak German. Perfect. You see that? Because if you think it, you say it, the actions follow. But, oh, I can't do that. Oh, he can't do that. Oh, he can't. you hear that negativity crap all the time. There was a, there was a group that went to a... A uh, bunch of elementary school kids, and they said, what is that? You know what the kids said? They said, oh, it's when the bird flies over, he's looking down, and it's the telephone pole. He says, when my daddy's driving at night, it's the things that hit the window. You know, he said, that's in, in the bike of my, my, my brother's bike, there's a little spoke, and it's in the middle part of it. They had a jillion answers for what that was. Then they take them to high school kids and ask the high school kids, what is that? What do you think they say? It's a dot. <laughs> it's a red circle. That's all they got. So why does your thinking go from this to this? Because your expectations are lowered. Why? Because society tells you you can't do that. No, you cannot do that. Women, you can't make as much as men. Men, you probably can't do that either. It's amazing. We have a world that dra drags us down. You know two crabs? You know how, do you, can, how do you can keep a crab in a bucket? Put another one with it. One crab alone is going to get out. But two crabs, as soon as the one starts getting out, what does this one do? Pull them down. That's just, we live in a crab society. It's amazing how much crap we talk about other people all the time. Don't be a freaking crab. <laughs> can I say that in BYU Hawaii? I hope so. Okay, so there is no can't. Okay, let's see if this works. And we are moving time. What's amazing is he could think of all the reasons in the world why he can't make a nail polish business be wonderful in a multi-million dollar company. He could think of all the reasons in the world why he can't speak Arabic. He could think of all the reasons in the world why he can't play a guitar. But why is he playing a guitar? Why is he playing a guitar? Because he can. Because he absolutely can.
He absolutely can. You ever have, uh, use the word if? Ah, oh, if only my, who'd ever, who's ever thought, ah, oh, if only my dad made a little bit more money. You know, only if I was born in the United States, or only if I could, could be a little taller, or I was a little prettier, or whatever if. The problem with that thinking is if you use that word, then the next, si- the, next, the next line is what? An excuse of why you're not successful in whatever you're doing. If you're not successful, who's the reason? You are the reason. It's no one else. And when you, when you sincerely understand that, that's a huge step in the successful arena. If you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. Failure. Failure is my next secret. Love to fail. I love to fail. I was a discus thrower in high school. And my buddy comes up to me and says, PJ, he's one of my best friends on the planet still, and he says, PJ, you need to lose some weight, gain some shape, and win a medal. I'll never forget that, because I was a fat, pudgy kid. When I, was, when I was young, I was fat. I don't mean fat, I mean fat. Like, when I was laying down or standing up, I was about the same height. I was fat. <laughs> my brothers used to say, when PJ sits around the house, he sits around the house. We had a dog, he sat on his tail, now we have to call him Beaver. I mean, he, he said, they were, they were ruthless. I have three older brothers, and man, they were terrible. Anyway, failure can be great. Failure can be the best. When I failed in business here and went to Korea for $300 in a plane ticket, I was like the bumblebee. The bumblebee cannot fly. Did you know that? It is impossible for a bumblebee to fly. The body is too heavy and too big for the size of the wings. doesn't matter how fast they could do them, a, bu- a bumblebee cannot fly. But do you know why he flies? No one ever told him he can't. Shh, don't tell him. They can't fly. It is aeronautically, scientifically impossible for a bee to fly. But don't tell them. Failure can be wonderful. I failed because I didn't account for finances. I didn't account for as much uh, investments as I would need. Today, we have started and either helped or worked with more than 120 companies going into South Korea. A lot of companies. We've helped them go into Japan and Hong Kong. And these companies, some of them listened to us, and some of them didn't. And it wasn't because we know everything. It was because we'd been there and done that with so many other companies. We kind of figured it out. If I was to start again, I would not start from BYU-Hawaii. I worked for about a year and a half at the Polynesian Culture Center and then went on my... I would have gone and worked for a consulting or a business company that was in the international trade for a few years. If I was to do it all over again, I would go work for a company before I broke off on my own. Because I paid what I call a lot of tuition. I paid a lot of tuition. Failures in uh, many different things. There's an an individual in this room that has failed with me, and we've paid dearly. We failed. But the reason we didn't fail, and the reason that we are continuing to be successful is why? Because we got up! We got up and did it again. Man, my voice sounds terrible. Okay, failure, it's a learning experience. So I have not failed. I've just learned a lot. (laughs) I've learned a lot. And it's cost me a lot, but I've learned a lot. Okay, biography of a failure. Who can tell me who this is? He failed. He failed in business. He failed. He failed in legislature. Who is it? It's Abraham Lincoln. He's one of the most, he has the, the, the biggest statues in Washington. He has the biggest statue in Washington. He's known worldwide as one of the most influential, awesome leaders on the planet, and he failed more than all of y'all already have, or probably will. Failure is learning experience. Success is, the right, is right under your nose. Okay, I have $300 up here. I need someone to tell me my parents' anniversary date. If someone can tell me the day, month, and year, you get the $300, and that's a promise. It's yours, yes. I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> no. Who can, who can guess it? Who can tell me who it is? It's yours. It's yours. Yes. Okay. Okay. I need... It's right under your freaking nose. Yes. Dell and Virgie Rogers. Their first date was their honeymoon. And that was a, I'll tell you that story later. 
Their first date was seriously their honeymoon. That was their very first date. Yes. Is that, oh, what year? My parents' anniversary date. Okay, that is incorrect. Okay, I need y'all, I think it's right here somewhere, under your chair, there's a little piece of paper typed, and now it's too late to answer, by the way. There's a little piece of paper. There's a little piece of paper. What, is it? what does that piece of paper say? There's another one. Somebody other, somewhere, some, there's another one somewhere. You don't have to look for it, but. <clears throat> this is a true story. There was a guy that lived in California. He was a gold miner, and he was going to look for gold. Looking for gold is a lot harder than looking for a little piece of paper under your chair, I promise you. Looking for gold is insane, right? He panned for gold, he dug for gold, he had a, he, and he, it was a squatter's right, and so this particular place by the American River, you can Google it if you want, they were, they were gonna build a dam. And so, he had, but he was squatting so long, it was his, his property. And he was poor, shack, you know, nothing. He had nothing. The government tried to get it, you know, buy the land from him. He wasn't interested. They had to wait till he died. And then after he died, they came in with the bulldozer and dug under his, under his house. And right under this back doorstep, about four and a half feet, five feet down, two inches wide, and about four inches tall, there was a vein of gold worth millions and millions and millions of dollars. This is a true story. He lurked all over the world and all over California, all in the mountains, all in this, you know, for finding this gold, and it was right under his feet. You have the same type of opportunity right now. It is right under your feet. Not only in the network that you have at BYU Hawaii, get to know your professors. Get to know them and get to know them well. At the end of your, you're ready to graduate, and you go, oh, professor, so-and-so, I've been in your office three times, but can you write my recommendation letter? What are they going to say about you? Yeah, he was a good, he came to class a lot, yeah, and he made it be in the class. I mean, what, are you, what is he going to say? Go get to know your professors. Go get to know professors that aren't your professors. Spend that time doing that as, as opposed to gaming or talking to your friends. Spend some time on your freaking future. <laughs> and that's the reason you will be successful, whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you are a businessman, because everybody in business is an entrepreneur. Everybody. People love to hire entrepreneurs. Why? Because they're going to figure out how to do the process better. They're going to figure out how to do something better. And I don't have any more time. So, vein of gold. Okay, there are two kinds. This is my uh, fifth secret. There are two kinds of pains you will have to endure. Guaranteed, there are two kinds of pains you will have to endure. Guaranteed. It's one of two things. The pain of discipline or the pain of regret. If you are keep to the standards of the church, you don't have to deal with the pain of freaking repenting. It's a pain to repent. It is a pain to go into the bishop. If you will keep the, use the discipline of keeping the standards. If you're honest, you don't have to remember what you said. If you don't lie, you don't ever have to remember what you said. What a great thing. My bishop told me that many years ago, so that's what I do. If a girl comes up and says, do you think I'm fat? I'm going to say, yeah, yeah, I think you're kind of chubby. If I think she's chubby. If I think she's cute, I'm going to say, hey, you're not bad, you're cute. Oh, wow. <laughs> I, I wouldn't say that because I'm a professor now. But <laughs> the pain of discipline or the pain of regret, you're going to have to deal with one of the two. So get ready. Okay, we don't have time for that. Sorry. There is no try, though. There is no try. There's absolutely no, no try. Okay. Uh, I'm going to change. I'm not going to do this one. I'm going to do another one. There was a two cubs in a little... In a little uh, uh, two cubs in a little uh, cave. These cubs in this cave, they were wandering around, kind of getting hungry. So the mom thinks, oh, they're hungry. So they walk off. Or the mom wanders off the, out of the cave to go find them some meat to eat, right? So she wanders off, and then the, one of the cubs follows her, starts to follow her down the hill. What do you, and she doesn't know it. And then, so she trots off pretty fast. What do you think the cub does? Gets lost. Do you think he turns around and tries to hike back up the mountain, or just keeps going down? He goes down. Why? Because we take the easy path. That's what normal, most average, average people do. We just take the easy path. So he starts going down, and pretty soon he reaches this beautiful meadow. And it's a large meadow, and this is called the Meadow of Mediocrity. The Meadow of what? Mediocrity. That wasn't very loud. Meadow of? Mediocrity. Mediocrity. Just kind of, the, you know, just the same, same, what everybody does. We just be normal, you know. So he fills them. 
He makes feel kind of fuzzy. He feels kind of fuzzy. Well, I guess this is where I ought to be. This is what I ought to be doing. So he, they, he looks at them, and they're all d- down eating this grass. We're going to call this the grass of habit. What's it called? <laughs> the grass of habit. So he starts eating this grass of habit. What do you think it, ta- it tastes like to this carnivore? It's terrible. It's bitter. bitter. So he starts to wander off thinking, no, this isn't for me. But there's a sheep herder there with a big staff. We're going to call this sheep herder the attitude herder. What's his name? The attitude herder. And he has a staff which is called the stick of condition. The stick of what? Condition. Condition. So he takes this big staff and he herds this cub, lion, back into the herd of sheep. Because our attitude often controls our conditions. Often controls our conditions. And who controls your attitude? You do. So he puts it, and he does it many times. He tries to wander off because it's no good. He keeps him in there, his attitude, with a sick of condition. Pretty soon, this little uh, cub grows up to a big lion after a few months. Now this big lion is hanging out with these sheep. And one time, this sheep herder herds him down to this beautiful stream. We're going to call this a stream of realization. What's it called? Stream of realization. Realization. Realizing who you are. And this particular day, it was glass. And this lion, for the first time, bent down and saw what? Who he really was. Who his creator designed him to be. A lion. He he instinctively lets out this tremendous roar. Walks back up to the top of the mountain as a full-grown lion now. And he says to himself, I will never again wander in the meadow of mediocrity and eat grass with the sheep. I was born to live at the crest of the hill, the crest of my hill. I was born to eat meat. You were born to live at the crest of each individual one of your heels, whether it's a business that you're in, whether it's a, a function that you're doing, or whatever you're doing, you were live to, born to live at the crest of your heel. So I would challenge you to live like your creator, God, our eternal Father, has created you to be wonderful and awesome. And if you're not wonderful and awesome, shame on you. Brigham Young said it, hell is when... The person you are meets the person that you could have become. Dang, that's going to be a bad day for some of us. Because we could have been this and done this and had this and been able to share this and done all these wonderful things, but because we didn't, 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 we weren't able to do that. Hell is when the person you are meets the person you could have become. So I strive daily. I get up and tell myself how handsome I am every day. Bug the crap out of my wife. I tell how beautiful my wife is every day. Bugs that hurts for me to say that. I would challenge you to do the same thing. Call your mom up today and say, Mom, you are awesome. You're the greatest. I love you, Mom, for no reason. Compliment 10 different people today. It'll make you feel better, I promise. Business is wonderful. Ethics are much more wonderful. Your morals are more important. Again, you were created to be great, and I challenge you to do just that. I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. Okay, w- one second. Balance. I didn't answer this one. You don't. How do you balance your family and work? You absolutely don't. I was translating for Elder Bednar in Korea, and a bishop stood up in a training meeting. And he says, How do you balance work and, you know, the church and all of this? And Elder Bednar says, ha, ha, Are you kidding? You don't. When you need to go to church, go to church. When you need to serve in church, serve in church. When you need to do your visiting home teaching, do that. When you need to be with your family, be with your family. So there is no balance per se. Do what you need to do when you need to do it. And you know who will tell you what you need to do? The Spirit. Okay, I think I covered them all. Thank you.